In numerous passages in the Bible, like Proverbs 6, 16 to 19, for example, and throughout Christian history, we find lists of sins that people engage in, which, with God's help and self-discipline, we are to avoid to the best of our ability and for our own good. Perhaps best known outside the Bible are the seven deadly sins of pride, wrath, greed, sloth, lust, envy, and gluttony. The less we engage in those seven ways of thinking and being, the better our life will be and the greater blessing we will be to other people. Now, a good case can be made that pride is the deadliest of the deadly sins. Proverbs 16, verse 18 says very simply, pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. Today's Dr. Seuss story, The Zacks, is also about the problem with pride. And it's short enough that I can read you the entire story in less than two minutes. One day, making tracks in the prairie of Prax, came a north-going Zax and a south-going Zax. And it happened that both of them came to a place where they bumped. There they stood, foot to foot, face to face. Look here now, the north-going Zax said. I say, you are blocking my path. You are right in my way. I'm a north-going Zax and I always go north. Get out of my way now and let me go forth. Who's in whose way? Snapped the south-going Zax. I always go south, making south-going tracks. So you're in my way, and I ask you to move and let me go south in my south-going groove. Then the north-going Zax puffed his chest up with pride. I never, he said, take a step to one side. And I'll prove to you that I won't change my ways if I have to keep standing here 59 days. And I'll prove to you, yelled the south-going Zax, that I can stand here in the prairie of Prax for 59 years. For I live by a rule I learned as a boy back in south-going school. Never budge. That's my rule. Never budge in the least. Not an inch to the west. Not an inch to the east. I'll stay here. Not budging. I can and I will. If it makes you and me and the whole world stand still. Well, of course, the world didn't stand still. The world grew. In a couple of years, the new highway came through, and they built it right over those two stubborn zacks and left them there standing unbudged in their tracks. The great thing about stories is that they can seem silly, Yet there is often uncomfortable truth hiding in plain sight. We're told the Zaxes are taught to only go one way, north or south. In reality, they could have walked in any direction they wanted to go, even east or west. They were raised, trained, and focused on what they should do rather than on what they were able to do. And when the north-going Zacks and the south-going Zacks find themselves on a collision course, neither will budge. Now, they are not two cars facing each other on opposite sides of a one-lane covered bridge in northern Vermont. Right? Do you remember where they came face to face? In the prairie of Prax, which is this huge desert that doesn't have so much as a single blade of grass to interfere with them going in another direction. The point being, there was all kinds of room for them to come up with a solution, and in this case, a very simple one that cost nothing. All they each had to do was take a half step to the right or a half step to the left, and they both could have kept going where they wanted to go, but they didn't. They were too proud, stubborn, rigid and stupid and they ruined and wasted the rest of their entire lives.
because neither of them would humble themselves and show any kindness, flexibility, or creativity. Now, Jill, who, like me, loves Dr. Seuss, she said this story has bothered her from the time she was in third grade. And Jill, for those of you who don't know her, is really logical. And part of why the story bothered her so much is because they didn't even have to change. They didn't even have to move. All they had to do was let one Zax go through the legs of the other one. If you just got down and crawled, they could have kept going straight. Or if, the other, if one had bent down and the other just hopped over their back, they could, have, you know, they could have gone straight. But they lacked the vision. And again, the creativity, the flexibility, the willingness to find a solution, and they just pridefully and stubbornly insisted it was the other who had to move. Now, when one says he won't budge for 59 days, the other replies that he can wait for 59 years because apparently Zacks don't eat or go to the bathroom. I think about these things with Dr. Seuss stories. Maybe you don't. It's just, you know. And although their behavior and their choices on one level, it seems absurd. If we reflect for a moment, We have to be honest and search for the Zacks in ourselves. Because the truth is, we will always have trouble growing as individuals and as a community of Christ if we're unwilling to change, if we're unwilling to budge, if we're unwilling to consider someone else's feelings or perspectives. The fundamental flaw in both the north-going Zacks and the south-going Zacks is pride. And if we're honest, we'll acknowledge that the same fundamental problem permeates human relationships in many different settings, internationally, nationally, domestically, in our communities, and even in our families. And pride is such that it will always insist that it's the other one who needs to move. It's the other one who needs to change. It's the other one who needs to budge. It's the other one, their perspective that's got to shift. It's never us. It's them. Isn't it? The Southgoing Zacks refers back to how he was raised and what he was taught. For I live by a rule that I learned as a boy back in Southgoing school, never budge. That's my rule. Never budge in the least. And falling back on the saying, that's the way I was raised, is not a sufficient answer. Patty referred to the the three men who were murdered by the Ku Klux Klan. Well, they could say, that's the way I was raised. It's not a good enough answer. And it's precisely that sort of attitude that perpetuates conflicts of all kinds. There is too much Zax-like thinking among political leaders and the followers of both major parties in the U.S. today and around the world. No one will budge, not for 59 days, not for 59 years, and nothing is ever solved. And ideologues and blowhards on both sides keep saying outrageous, frequently untrue things about those with a different view, and no one considers compromising. No one is willing to change or grow because to do so is to suggest the possibility that maybe I wasn't 100% right and their pride doesn't allow it. And even when statements are demonstrated to be false, people don't apologize. They don't express gratitude that the truth has come out. And so we are governed by Zacks and nothing gets done because pride would rather self-destruct than change. Now, one thing I would love to see for charity, and I'd be willing to be the narrator, is I would love to have Kevin McCarthy and Nancy Pelosi. For those of you who don't know who they are, that's the majority leader and minority leader in the House of Representatives. Wouldn't it be wonderful to hear them reading the parts of the North and South going Zacks? (laughs) You know, I mean, can you picture that? That would be good theater. This is not to say that there are not principles that we are to hold on to. 
and that we are to advocate for. But pride is so slippery that people will insist that the things we refuse to consider changing our thinking about are precisely those kinds of absolute principles. And the things that other people refuse to budge on clearly don't have the same level of authority, validity, or significance. And when opinions carry more weight than facts, you can be sure that pride is involved. It's like the saying, when I complain, I do so because it's good for me to get things off my chest. When you complain, I remind you that complaining doesn't help anything. No one likes a complainer. Pride and stubbornness, as some of us painfully know, impacts all of our relationships. And it can poison and attack parents and children, husbands and wives, brothers and sisters, friends and neighbors. And people dig in, they hold grudges, They refuse to forgive, too proud to admit any part or role in any estrangement, and unwilling to move, and everyone suffers and everyone loses when that happens. Now, in one of the great chapters in the Bible, in 1 Corinthians 13, Paul tells us in words that are very familiar and not practiced enough that love is patient, love is kind, Love is not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude. And it does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. Love is one thing to hold on to and to practice without wavering, without faltering, and without ever giving up. Now, there's a difference between the kind of pride that God hates, and God does hate a certain kind of pride. That's what Proverbs 8.13 tells us. There's a difference between the pride that God hates and the pride that we take in a job well done, or the pride we take in someone else's successes and accomplishments. On Friday night, we had a couple hundred people here for a dinner, and we spent almost an hour just celebrating people in our church, our volunteers, and all the different ways they serve. God loves that. There's nothing wrong with that. But the kind of pride that God doesn't like stems from self-righteousness, and it's sin. And God hates it because it's a hindrance to seeking the Lord. And Psalm 10, verse 4, explains that the proud are so consumed with themselves, so filled with themselves, that their thoughts are far from God. It says, in his pride, the wicked does not seek him. In all his thoughts, there is no room for God. And this kind of haughty pride is the opposite of the spirit of humility that God seeks. You remember back in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The poor in spirit are those who recognize their utter spiritual bankruptcy and our inability to come to God aside from God's grace. You know, if it wasn't for God's grace, I would be utterly lost. That's what we have to be able to say. And when we can say that, there's room for God to come in. The proud, on the other hand, are so blinded by their pride, they think they have no need for God, or worse, that God should simply accept them because they deserve God's acceptance, because I'm so wonderful. How could God not love me? You know, you know why should I have to change? Now, a godly companion to love, which is also an antidote for pride, is humility. And we began the service with those verses from Isaiah 66 and verse 2, where God says, this is the one to whom I will look the humble and contrite in spirit who trembles at my word. And Proverbs 22, verse 4 says, the reward for humility and fear of the Lord is riches and honor and life. Now in the Bible, we learn that God leads the humble, God teaches the humble, God gives grace to the humble. And even when we're trying to do all those things, life itself will humble us. Our health can change, our finances can change, 
Life can take a turn we don't expect. The future is never guaranteed. Frequently we have to adapt and adjust to the unexpected. That's part of life. But all those opportunities can also be the occasion to learn greater humility and reliance on God. Where do you find yourself today when it comes to pride and humility? Augustine gave the following advice to people who wanted to get ahead. He said, do you wish to rise? Begin by descending. You plan a tower that will pierce the clouds. Lay first the foundation of humility. I think most of us find genuine humility appealing in other people, don't we? You know, the people you know who do lots of wonderful things, and they never want to take any credit for it. They never want to be in the spotlight. And it's endearing. Whereas arrogant pride is almost always a turnoff. Uh, I don't mean any disrespect to Ricky Henderson, who was a Hall of Fame baseball player, but when Ricky Henderson stole third base when he was playing for the A's and set the new all-time record, he literally bent down, picked up the base, held it over his head, and said, now I am the greatest of all time. Now that's not exactly fulfilling the proverb which says, let another praise you and not your own lips. And because God is both a baseball fan and, oh, that's just a fact, and God is a baseball fan and God has a sense of humor, God allowed Nolan Ryan to pitch a record-setting no-hitter that same night that took all the headlines away from Ricky Henderson. I thought that was hysterical. Well, the story of this act, sadly, has an unhappy ending. Most Dr. Seuss stories don't have an unhappy ending. But this one does. And a whole world ends up being built around the North Goings Acts and the South Goings Acts, a world with highways and cars and buildings and bridges. And you know what happened to them? The longer they stood unwilling to move, the less room they have to go anywhere. And their pride is such that it gets so hardened and there's no end in sight to their foolish impasse And they picked a my way or the highway kind of thinking. And even when the highway came in, they still didn't move. Now, what is a highway? What does a highway do? A highway allows the world to grow by connecting one place to another, by connecting new people and new areas. It allows new relationships to come into being. And if you look in the story, the line, of course, the world didn't stand still. The world grew That appears right before the highway is introduced. And the road is a nice contrast to the Zacks. And in the book, it shapes itself around the obstacles. It's curvy and moves, while the Zacks very stubbornly refuse to move in any way they don't want to move. If any of us have strained relationships with other people, Maybe we can learn to be more like the highway in the story than the Zacks. Or maybe we can even be a Zacks who's willing to budge. And we can ask God to humble us and open us to being willing to admit, we admit maybe I was mistaken. Or maybe we were even right. But we were so arrogant about being right that that was bad. You know, one of the great stories in the Bible in Luke 15 is the father with the two prodigal sons. And I think one of the greatest examples of grace in the Bible is when the son comes back from the pigsty, which there's no lower job for a good Jewish boy than feeding pigs. And when he comes home, his father never says, I told you so. We can be right and still mess things up. Pride closes doors. It closes doors in relationships. Sometimes it even slams them shut. Humility, on the other hand, opens the door to forgiveness and reconciliation and learning and love. Love and humility are the opposite of pride. A philosopher in another tradition wrote 2,500 years ago, I have three precious things which I prize and hold fast. The first is gentleness. The second 
is frugality. The third is humility. Got those? Be gentle and you can be bold. Be frugal and you can be generous. Avoid putting yourself first and you can be a leader of men. If nothing else, occasionally swallow your pride. And the good news is, it has zero calories. It's totally non-fattening to swallow our pride. The great 16th century reformer of the church, Martin Luther, said, God created the world out of nothing. So as long as we are nothing, he can make something out of us. Let's pray. God, we know pride's a a tough subject to hear about. None of us wants to think that we are like a Zax. None of us wants to think we are that prideful and stubborn and immovable. So we thank you for the other people who really needed to hear this sermon. (laughs) But God, just in case we may have missed something that you actually intended for us, We really pray that you would open our heart, mind, and spirit. And God, would you come in and just clean out any spirit of arrogant, stubborn, self-righteous pride. God, get it out of us and in its place. Fill us with the spirit of Jesus, which is a spirit of love and humility and kindness and generosity, and service. God, we pray that you would transform us as only you can do. In Jesus' name, amen.